Hello, this message is for everyone that's watching on YouTube. Don't fast forward to EJ. We've been seeing a lot of views on YouTube. So if you've been watching these classes on YouTube and you wish to get your certificate, at the end for completion, you have to take an exam. So again, if you wish to, please email EJ. This looks upside down now. So at imadjona7 at gmail.com. That's I-M-A-D-J-O-N-N-A, -N -N the number seven at gmail.com. Or you can text me at 248 3886639. So if you wish to receive your certificate and need to take the exam and you've just been watching on YouTube and not attending classes, please reach out to us. Everybody else will be starting shortly. We're waiting on a few people to come in. Okay, excuse me. Uh, yes. Uh, 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 that's for the Zoom? No, the guys on Zoom will get a hold of you. We have everybody's information. Uh, is this Ammar? Yes, I am Amar. Yeah, we have everybody's information, but Amar, there's been like 20 to 50 people on YouTube that have been watching on YouTube because we post these and we don't know who they are. So if they want to get, um, you know, credit for receive credit for it, they need to reach out to us. But Amar, we already have your info. Yeah, I know. I am I am once in the Arabic and change here, so it's okay. Okay, okay. Well, thank welcome. you so much. I'm going yeah. to tell Masir, you switch sides. Yeah, that's the email. E email is coming to me. But go to the English English language. <laughs> so it's okay. I don't. <laughs> yeah. All okay, right. brother. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Let's go to the let's go to the next screen. The next screen. Sounds like a better layout. Sorry, everybody. I'm uh, 
waiting for everybody to show up. We're on Chaldean time. It's very important now in the next few weeks, four or five weeks, that we try to really do whatever we can to show up. Because uh, we're going to get in the heart of the New Testament, especially when we get to the Eucharist. I don't want anybody to miss that class because uh, that, that's going to be a great, great class. So in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Oh, Holy Spirit, beloved of my soul, I adore you. Light and guide strength and console me. Tell me what I have to say and do. Command me to do it. For I promise to be submissive in everything you will ask of me and permit all that you want to happen to me. Only show me what is your holy will. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Again, like to reiterate that we try to get done before Thanksgiving and there will be like a week. I will try to get together with everybody and give them the exam. All right. That's uh, that's, so we're going to try to really give a lot of material before we, we get there. So today's reading is from chapter three in John's gospel. We'll go there. It's with Nicodemus visits Jesus. Now we know from scripture that Nicodemus was a Pharisee. And not only was he a Pharisee, he was, he was probably a teacher in the Pharisee ranks. And we know from the synoptics, he's a master. So he, he was part, when you were like a master Pharisee, you were higher up and you were part of, uh, you shared a little bit part of the, with the priestly class. Even though they had different beliefs, they shared together, sorry about that. We shared this classroom and some of their uh, materials falling down. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born anew, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born anew. The wind blows where it wills, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can this be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand this? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen. But you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven but he who descended from heaven, the son of man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the, wilderness, in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God sent the son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed 
in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now there are three really key themes here. We're going to see, and it's going to carry on as we, as we read more into it in the second half when we talk about the Samaritan woman. Another key thing is, again, logos and wisdom. The knowledge and wisdom of God. And again, we also will see descending theology. Another key theme is, as I wrote on the board, is light and darkness. Gentile and Jew. Now, before I get into my notes... Let's just briefly talk about Nicodemus. I know you guys seen some Jesus movies, Jesus of Nazareth. You've seen Master Nicodemus, and um, the new uh, series of movie, The Chosen. We beautiful portrayal portrayal of, of Nicodemus. Biblically speaking, we don't know if he was in the Galilean regions of Galilee at the time when he met Jesus. We don't know that. But we do know, as scripture told us, that this character, who later becomes a believer in Jesus, with him, with Joseph Arimathea, most likely defended him in that corrupt uh, trial. We're going to, when we get into the passion of Jesus, we'll talk about it. He comes in the night, comes in darkness. He doesn't come in the light. And how beautifully Jesus says, John says, when he's uh, speaking, when Jesus is speaking through Jesus, he says, as we were reading about light and darkness, a key theme in John's, throughout John's gospel. We see that Nicodemus came in the dark. He says, teacher, we know you're from God. So Nicodemus must have heard Jesus preaching. Must have seen his miracles. It's not biblically, you know, it was nice in the chosen that, you know, that if, we, if those who have seen it, those who have not seen it, Nicodemus goes out and tries to heal uh, Mary Magdalene was possessed with the devil and he cannot do it. There's reported that she was healed. We don't know that. That's not scripture. But it's beautiful that they portray that Nicodemus was touched by Jesus. And we don't we know through scripture, reading this, that he was touched by Jesus because he clearly says, you know, you're a teacher from God. Nobody has said your words. Nobody can do what you're doing. So his heart has been moved. But he's scared. He's scared of his position. He's scared that his brother, Pharisees, teachers, rabbis do not accept Jesus. He's not proclaiming Jesus from the rooftop. He's at unease. Even though he's very educated and knows the Mosaic tradition, knows the Mosaic law, knows the Torah, he doesn't fully open up. He wants to stay at a human level. And we're going to see this again in the Samaritan woman. That's why Jesus has his great discourse. He said to him, unless you be born again of water and spirit, you know, you have no life in you. And he says to him, you might, how, how am I to be born again? Am I to re-enter my mother's womb? You know, I'm an old man. How, you know, this is not going to happen. And Jesus pretty sure looked at him and says, you don't get it. You're not getting it. You're going to have a rebirth, a new birth again.
You're going to be born again anew. You're going to be born of water and spirit. Not two different rebirth, one of water, one of spirit, but of both of them together, of water and spirit. And that's the true birth. Jesus challenges Nicodemus to think outside of the human realm. He wants Nicodemus to think differently. He wants Nicodemus to go to a higher plane. And he says to him, you know, Nicodemus, you're pretty smart. You're a Pharisee. But how do you want me to explain heavenly things but when you're not even grasping earthly things? It's only by the Holy Spirit. It's only by the Holy Spirit who reveals Jesus to us. We do not know, and I have to reiterate this time and time again, we do not know what a great gift we've got at baptism when we receive the Holy Spirit. If we can only go into an x-ray machine and x-ray the Holy Spirit in our soul, how great of a gift we have. I heard that at a, at, at a homily on Pentecost about the x-ray machine. Because this whole discourse, this whole discourse with Nicodemus is about the Trinity, is about the messianic secret. It's about what the mission of our Lord Jesus Christ is about. It's about the fulfillment of all the covenants. And it's about eternal life. Jesus' discourse is about the Father and the Holy Spirit. It's about truth concerning the Holy Spirit. Because only Jesus knows the truth about the Father. And the Father is merciful and unconditional love for us. When Jesus is in this dialogue with Nicodemus, he clearly says, if you want to understand this, you have to become my follower. If you want to really understand this, you must be baptized. Now, we know at that time there was no fullness of baptized. You know, we did not have Pentecost. But we have great solace that Joseph of Arimathea and Master Nicodemus did get baptized. And they were disciples of Jesus. And they continued on. Jesus is clearly stating that one must have a new birth. This is not nothing new, guys. This is all throughout Scripture. Peter, look up Ezekiel 36.25. Elias, look up Isaiah 32.15. Christine, look up Joel 2.28-29. 28 through 29. When you get that, let me get to mine too. Hang on one second because I was giving you guys a. You can come up here and read it a little bit if you want. You guys can all come up and read them. Ezekiel 36, 25. I will sprinkle clean water upon you, 
and you shall be clean from your uncleanliness and from all your idols. I will cleanse you. A new heart I will give you and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will take out of your flesh the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to observe my ordinances. You shall dwell in the land which I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. Isaiah 32, 15, until the spirit is poured upon us from on high and the wilderness becomes a fruitful field and the fruitful field is deemed a forest, then justice will dwell in the wilderness and righteousness abide in the fruitful field. And the effect of righteousness will be peace and the result of righteousness, quietness and trust forever. Joel 2, 28 through 29. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Even upon the men servants and maid servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit. And I will read from Acts 2, 37 through 38. When they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we can see... And again, if you want to go on, we could, re we could read 1 Corinthians... 6, 3, 11, 1 Peter 3, 21. So this is not nothing new. It was in the Hebrew scriptures. But what Jesus is telling Nicodemus clearly, when he tells him that you must be born anew, is that the old law, the law, is not going to give you life. This is, And St. Paul reiterates this time and time again. That's why I've told you once, I'll tell you, if you take a summary of all of St. Paul's teachings, it's this. You have been given such a great gift of your baptism that you become children, heirs of God. Live in that baptismal promise. Live according to your baptismal promise because you are a child of God. He's saying the fulfillment what Jesus is teaching Nicodemus. He says, you know, Nicodemus, you know, you're a master of the law, but that law is not going to give you life. It's not going to bear it. And this is reiterated time and time again by St. Paul and the early church. Now, that he's got Nicodemus' attention. He really tells Nicodemus, once you receive this new life, people are going to think differently of you. Not so much in the text, but people will never understand where a Christian comes from and where a Christian is going. If you're not of the faith, they're never going to understand. We come from God, we're born anew in God, and we're going back to the Father through the Son. John Paul II talks about this a lot. We come from God, we're going back to God. Jesus is telling them, I understand this because I understand the Father. I am going to reveal the Father par excellence. I am going to do the Father's will. 
I have divine knowledge. You need that divine knowledge. Earthly knowledge is not good enough. You must grow in heavenly knowledge, in heavenly stature. You know, there, there's so many things in Christianity. Some people come to me and says, you know, it's so confusing. We can't understand, you know, the mysteries of the Trinity. We can't understand the mysteries of the sacrament. And I said to him, what do you think? You're going to grab a theological book or the, and you're going to sit down and read it and you're going to get your answers and you're going to get your hypothesis. You're going to do your mathematical formula. That's not what is, that's not going to work. You want to understand the Trinity? It's not that Jesus gave us a mystery that it's a heart, a wall in front of us and we can't penetrate it. Not at all. In order for us to better understand the Trinity and better understand the spiritual realm that God is inviting us to participate in, we need to bend the knee. This is what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus. Yes, you know some precepts of, of my father, but you don't have a relationship with him. If you want to know some, uh, break down a little bit of the mysteries, talk to our Lord Jesus Christ, ask the Holy Spirit, befriend the Holy Spirit, and do it in prayer. I promise you, the nudging of the heart will take place and you will start understanding things better. We cannot do it by a scientific formula, by reading a book. This is exactly what, you, because Nicodemus read the Hebrew law. He knew it. He was a master Pharisee. But he was bewildered. I love this passage. He was bewildered by the knowledge of Christ, God. He was taken back. Now, the passage goes on. It doesn't stop there. I tell you, the revelation is unbelievable in that passage. I remember we had to read one of our exams in one of my scripture classes. Was to, he was going to appoint a passage. He, he was teaching a day class and a night class. I happened to be in the night class, and we sat down, and, and this was the passage he handed out. Maybe there was two of them in there. I don't, I don't remember asking people. But I got a copy of this. He said, read this scripture. You got one class period to interrupt, interpret it to me. No bragging rights. I, I did good on it. And when, when Jesus continues to, I talked about higher knowledge. And I also talked about when I was sitting there writing, I'm not the greatest writer. Uh, the new uh, typewriters and all those uh, packages that make you spell better and your grammar is better. I mean, if I sit there and think about it, you know, I'm, I'm not half bad, but that helps me a lot. But the Holy Spirit opened it to me that Jesus is telling Nicodemus that he is the Messiah. He is God incarnate. And that he is going to take away our sins. He is going to die on the cross because he clearly says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, and all who look on him will be saved. If you look a little deeper, this is just me, if you look a little deeper, and I'm going to ask you guys in class, I don't know where the rest of us are today in class, but what does this, what did the serpent represent? You guys online can, can jump in too. What did the serpent represent for the Israelites? Mike, what do you think a serpent represented on that bronze when, when Moses in the book of Numbers lifted it up and they were all being bit by snakes? Are you guys listening over there? Are you, am I on audio with you? Yes. Do you know? You want to answer that, Mike? Is Mike not on right now? Does anybody want to answer that? Did he represent? Uh, did the serpent represent their unbelief, their uh, complaining, their uh, murmuring in the desert? 
Yeah. He represents Satan. The serpent represented Satan. Sin. You're right. The murmuring. Because in the Canaanites, one of their deities was the serpent. So you're going to say, then why would God want the serpent on that cross that Moses lifted up? Because it was kind of a cross. It goes from what St. Paul teaches us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. That's, this is exactly what this is telling us. That he who no, knew no sin became sin. He who was perfect, unblemished, everything perfect, took the stripes for our, our iniquities, was placed on that cross, and whoever looked on that, which is folly, to everything in the world, is perfect remedy for sin. So you can interpret that when the snakes were the sin, and then when he put the bronze snake on... And they were, and they were biting them. They were the they, healing power of Christ, because then Christ took on sin, and then he was nailed to the cross, yeah. Look what some of the fathers have said about this. Don't take my word for it. Look what this, some of the fathers. I looked it up today. St. Cyril of Alexandria says this. The story is a type of the whole mystery of the incarnation. For the serpent signifies bitterly and deadly sin, which devouring the whole race on the earth, biting the soul of man and infusing in it with it venom of wickedness. And there's no way that we could have escaped being conquered by it except by the relief that comes only from heaven. The word of God then was made in the likeness of a sinful flesh that he might condemn sin in the flesh as it is written. In this way, he becomes the giver of unending salvation to those who comprehend the divine doctrines and gaze on him with steadfast faith. But the serpent being fixed upon a lofty base signifies that Christ was clearly manifested by his passion on the cross so that none could fail to see him. Again, we'll go to St. Ambrose. St. Ambrose says this about this passage. It was good that the Lord ordained that. By the lifting of the bronze serpent, the wounds of those who were bitten should be healed. For the brazen serpent is a type of the cross. In the same way, the world was crucified in its allurements. Therefore, not a real but a brazen serpent was hung. This is so because the Lord took on himself the likeness of a sinner. Again, let me reiterate, the Lord took on himself the likeness of a sinner in his body, but in actuality was without sin. In this way, he imitated a serpent through the deceitful appearance of human weakness, so that when he laid aside the slaw of the flesh, he might destroy the cunning of the true serpent, who is Satan. You know what's so outstanding about St. Paul? And I'm going to give you a quick synopsis of the book of Revelation. Me and my friend Elias were just arriving here today, and we were talking about the work of Christ. And, we were talk, and, and Elias had some questions about Satan and his power and stuff like that. And I said, and, and Elias was right. He said, victory's at hand. I said, Elias, well, we are here is mop-up duty. Christ did all the work. That's why St. Paul says, what's the matter with you Christians? Why are you, you know, going away and going back into your evil ways? You don't know how good you have it. Because the devil, the serpent, is nothing but a liar, a murderer, and a thief. Nothing. And he can't, Mess with us unless 
we allow him, lest we open the door. If we, because our baptism protects us, our newness of life protects us, because our Lord and his Holy Mother protects us, the saints protect us, the sacramentals around their house protect us, our prayer life protects us. He might try to trip us when we're getting closer and closer, but he has no power over us when we give ourselves anew. Because we're born anew. We don't belong to him no more. One is Satan is tempting you. And sometimes that miserable stealer who wants to steal our soul gets us. We fall. But just tell him, get away. I belong to Jesus. I'm born anew. I don't belong to you, Satan. I love the way Father uh, why am I not thinking of his name right now? Oh, Father John Vianney, St. John Vianney. He, he never was scared of the Satan. He would say, you know, Satan would try to tease him and he would say, get away from you. Get away from you. You got, you got nothing on me. Tomorrow, I am going to save so many souls in the confessional. And it used to drive Satan crazy. There's a story of a couple of monks were traveling in the, in the countryside of France and came upon uh, St. John Vianney's parish. And they, and they came to the simple priest, the cure of the Rs, and they asked him if they can lodge for a couple of days. He said, sure. He said, you know, I don't, I don't have a lavish life. You know, I live on, you know, bread and potatoes, stuff like that. He says, you know, but. And in the middle of the night, they were terrified. John Vianney's, St. John Vianney's bed was bouncing up and off the walls, you know. And he was just sleeping through it. And they were, they were terrified. They, they came knocking on the door. And they said, you know, John, John, you know, Father John, what's going on? He said, oh, don't worry about it. It's the devil. He, he doesn't, you know, he's trying to scare me, but he doesn't know how many souls, you know, I'm going to save tomorrow. St. John Vianney and Padre Pio were the only people that I know that could pierce through you in a confessional and know every one of your sins. And make you make a good confession. The devil has got nothing on us. And Jesus is telling Nicodemus this. I am going to save the world. I am going to be the new bronze, bronze serpent. And whoever looks on me will have eternal life. That's because right after that, we go to John 3.16. That's, that's in every football game, sporting event, you know. John 3.16 is everywhere. Everybody knows it by heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish and have eternal life. For God sent the son into the world not to condemn the world that the world might be saved through him. Now let me make this clear. When Jesus was crucified on that cross, he redeemed the whole world. When Jesus was on that cross, he redeemed the whole world. Redemption was perfected. Perfection. Sad to say, some people did not choose that redemption. Jesus' work was perfect. Salvation was for everyone. But we have to make our fiat to accept the salvation. The work was perfect. Bar none. His work of redemption was for everyone, and it was perfect. But not everyone chooses it, sadly, because they get cunned by that snake, that serpent, Satan. I was at a, I, I attend Bible studies too, especially now that uh, I have more time on my hand. I couldn't when I was working all the time. I try to get Elias to come with me. And I have to tell you, it's kind of sad and also very satisfactory to say it's sad because father dave santorum over here at the monastery is one of the great biblical scholars we have in the detroit area but what's sad about it i always tell him there's 15 16 i'm the i'm one of the youngest people there if not the youngest and i'm 59 years old some all of them are on canes and walking and 
we need to be have a more vibrant church. And one thing he said, he said, we're doing, uh, he was doing Matthew's gospel and, and we're just finishing the Sermon on the Mount. And I try to be quiet, you know, I just write one or two things that touch me. And he said that everything, everything in the world is unrighteous mammon. Only Christ is righteous. And I never thought about it that way. I never thought about it that way. Only Christ is going to save us. That's when he said you have, you can't worship two masters. Either you worship one, love one, or hate the other. Everything else in the world, other than Christ, other than God, is not going to save you. You cannot be its master. That doesn't mean that everything in the world is no good. It's neutral. You use it for your benefit. You lord over it. It doesn't become a master to you. Only one master, only one God, only one teacher, our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what he's telling Nicodemus. This is how beautifully he's telling them. Unless you be born again, anew, in water and spirit, be baptized. Remember how we, we had that great thing by St. Gregory of Nazianzus, how great the gift of baptism is. And in a couple of weeks, we're going to have a great class on the Eucharist. It's going to be a little elongated class, but it's going to be a great class on the Eucharist. But without baptism, we cannot receive the Eucharist, which is a source and summit, which is Jesus Christ himself, body, blood, soul, and divinity. We cannot receive it if we are not born anew. The dead body cannot receive it. So Jesus is opening the mind of Nicodemus later on when he becomes a disciple of him. I don't know, but I'd like to talk to Nicodemus when I get to heaven. And I know I might, you know, have to work out some of my uh, shortcomings. I don't mind it as long as I get to heaven. I would like to ask him, how, how would you teach about baptism? Because you got the best instruction in the world on baptism. Can you imagine Nicodemus, after he became a disciple, taught about baptism? Wow. Because he had the greatest instructor of all time. God himself teaching him. Half Torah about baptism. And remember I told you a couple weeks ago that Jesus' baptism is going to be the death on the cross? Is not? Do you not see this? That this is what Jesus is iterating to Nicodemus? Do you see that, Elias? When he says, I got a baptism to be baptized and I can't wait till it takes place. I want to bring the fire of the Holy Spirit. Because the fire of the Holy Spirit is the love. That's exactly what Father said today. Holy Spirit is love. And it's going to consume our hearts. You know, one of the main reasons why so many converts came into the church in Rome in the early, in the early period when, when the church was just getting started, why so many people flooded to it? Ryan, what do you, what do you think? What, what, what was one of, one of the main reasons why so many people flooded? To, not just the truth, but of course the truth. But I think the martyrs. The okay, yeah, the seed of martyrs, you know, it, you know, is is, you know, the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. That's true, but that's very. But I'm looking for something more simple. Don't go into the very simple. Yeah, Elias. There's no wrong answers here. You know, I was seeing Jesus acts miracles, and when he spoke to them after that, there was five thousand of them. Then they went and told another twenty thousand, and then they told other. You're kind of nudging it. Yeah. Why do you think the church expanded and, and grew so vastly in the early in its early stages? Yeah, Christine. There was more faith. There's more faith. That's that's uh, scratching the surface, but something very simple. Hey, AJ. Yes. Um, is it because of love? 
Love okay. exactly. These people were these people didn't have much. They were discriminated. They might even be thrown to lions, but they were so happy. These people said, "We don't have this happiness. These fake gods that we have in the Parthenon, they're not giving us this happiness. These people are joyous. When they worship, they really truly believe, and it brought floods of people. We want this. We don't have it in our lives. You're right, Mike." They came flooding into the church because they saw something they yearned for. And that's the gift of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I think somewhere now, somehow... This church, we, I'm sorry to say that. We trample on this gift. Go on. No, I was going to say, I think um, somewhere, somehow, we, we lost that, um, that sign, if you will, where the early Christians had it. Uh, I think you'll see that in areas where Christianity is being persecuted because Christians uh, and the faithful will come together and the amount of love and the the um, the um, God's presence among them in that struggle in that um, fight, if you will, is just so much more powerful. And you see that love at work when there is that, like in Egypt, for example, or other countries, China, the underground church. Well, it's growing. People, yeah, it's growing. Who, I told you today. The people have. Yeah, the people who have visited or know of, of them, they'll tell you they, they're, they're something different. They live a different life. The, you know, the Holy Spirit is, is, I mean, obviously the Holy Spirit is all over, it is with us too, but it's in a different way when you're actually, there's a struggle, there's a fight, and you're standing up for, for the faith, and, and there's that bond holding all the, um, you know, that's kind of, joining all the faithful together in a special way yeah we, in, the, in the west we want to cage the holy spirit let me tell you a true story this is a true story this is from one of my biblical teachers i'm not going to use no no names but a very prominent english woman from england you know said that you know a uh, conversation came up and, and said you know you know our christianity you know is what you know sets us apart and this and that and that's why we be, we become civilized and all this. And um, this person said, no, the Christianity in the West, especially in Europe, is a dying Christianity. She says, why? He says, because the church in Africa is alive and the church in China is alive and, and they have the Holy Spirit and there's miracles and, they, you know, and, and, and they're in love with the Lord and, you know, and they're radical. And she said, oh, no, we, we cannot bring that kind of religion back into Europe. We are scared. We want to cage the Holy Spirit. We, this is not the Holy Spirit that Jesus promised. The Holy Spirit is the a, is a third person of the Trinity, and he wants to turn our lives upside down in love from head to toe to our great God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. And it's a shame that we, we, we've turned, even Pope Saint now, Saint Pope John the 23rd, he had an inkling. He said, you know, we need, you know, we need the Holy Spirit back. And that's what it, the truth about the Second Vatican Council was not these, you know, you know, ordinances that, you know, you know, we, we started switching from the east to west, of, you know, where the posture of the priest is and, you know, all the, the main message was that we need to open up the air so the Holy Spirit can come back and take over the church. This is what, you know, and, and just the other day we celebrated the, the feast, the 60th birthday of the Second Vatican Council. If we had the true spirit of the Second Vatican Council, this is what the fathers of the Second Vatican Council really wanted. This is what the Holy Spirit told them. Not to run off on some path that's not true to, to our morality or our faith it's just to let the holy spirit in let's go back to the early church let's go back matter of fact i'm forgetting his name but cardinal um who passed away now said if you really want to get in touch with our faith we need to get back into the upper room we need to get back into a spirit of pentecost any questions about nicodemus Jesus, yes. I mean, just a comment on that. 
Is it as simple as saying that, just like John, St. John said, that the people like the darkness more than the light? Yeah. And they'll never change. We talked about it, one of the key things, yeah. And from the beginning, they had it, lost it, got it again, lost it. It's almost like the uh, arc of the film. Got it, lost it, got it, lost it again. And it's not, you know, it seems so simple. And don't get me wrong, we can all be like Nicodemus coming in the dark sometimes. We don't want to, you know, we're, we're kind of scared, uh, you know, you know, to spread out, you know, the faith. We, we can, we're pretty good at doing it at home, but when we're out in the public, that's fine. You'll grow. You grow into that. You know, we've, we've all made times where we, you know, we, we kind of are backed up in the corner and say, you know, right now, you know, it's not a, you know, good time to talk about God or, you know, but when we're, we're full of the Holy Spirit, he'll take over. He'll take over. The charisms of the Holy Spirit will take over. And the church needs the charisms of the Holy Spirit. We cannot have seven. I'm not knocking any of those beautiful people that come to the Bible studies. But we cannot have Bible studies in churches in the morning when we go to early math to have a bunch of elderly people and that's it. You get that say one thing about you know, that and it's uh, the love. You know, a lot, a lot of times this question gets asked, why are people leaving our church? Sad to say, the love isn't there. And if it was, nobody would leave. Yeah. Why would they leave? Well, the devil is doing everything he can to, to wreck that sometimes. Yeah. That's, you know, we'll have that. We'll have that discussion when we discuss the church. I, I was driving here when you were commenting about you and Elias's discussion about Satan. Yeah. He's got no power. No. Oh, well, he, he, oh, he is power. He's a seraphim. He's got power, but only when we let him in. And he's got knowledge. He's got beatific knowledge. Like, Doesn't got godly knowledge. He's got beatific knowledge. Like even that um, discourse that he was having with Jesus mm -hmm. took him to the highest point. Why well, did I think, well, that could have just been in his dreams. It didn't have to actually physically happen. And just like with us, he has no, he just comes in, makes a suggestion. I think that physically and happened with it, with, 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 in the wilderness. Yeah. yeah, I don't, I don't know. It I think it did because it, he tried to, you know, Jesus was tempted in every way. Clearly says that in chapter four of Hebrews, but without sin, you know, he was tempted. Um, but he didn't give in to temptation. Well, I'm he was tempting the humanity of Jesus. Jesus. It didn't have to happen in a physical yeah. way. It could yeah. happen in, you know, yeah. in a dream, just, you know. But, it, but the main thing about Satan, you got to remember three things. It's threefold. He's a murderer, he's a liar, and he's a thief from the beginning. That. He murdered. He mur he murdered Abel. He was a thief. Uh, he stole away, you know, the one-on-one -on -one intimacy that we had with God. You know, and he's a liar. And he's a liar. And he has no good in him. He all the only thing he can do, because Christ did everything on that cross. We were talking about how. He became the bronze serpent. And when Moses lifted up, so Christ will be lifted up. Everybody, you know, though, by the way, they before that happened, they tried to kill all those serpents. They were out there trying to kill him, and it didn't work. Man cannot justify himself. That's exactly what that, that passage in, in the book of Numbers. Man cannot do God's work. God himself had to come. And become anew the bronze serpent. That's what he's telling Nicodemus too. I love the book of Job. Because the heart of the book of Job. When they have this dialogue between Job and, and God the Father. And they have the dialogue. Or with the Trinity. In the midst of it. Job says is there anything I could have done to reckon myself. And God simply answers Job no. I have to reckon you. That means there's going to be, God is going to come in and fix the problem. The new Adam. The old Adam sinned. The new Adam did not sin. He reconciled sin. Any questions over there? Good, good, good observation. Always good. Doing First, we don't know how good we have it. We really don't. And yes, we need to be happy. You know, and, and 
when mass becomes special, when mass becomes really, it's not no longer an obligation. Yes, sometimes, you know, you know, there's schoolwork we got to get done. There's a report we got to get done. There's football games. One of the best things, one of the best things Archbishop Vigneron did for this diocese, and I know he catches a lot of flack. And he said that we're going to reclaim Sundays. Because even, and holy days. When I was a teacher at Brother Rice, I got up and said, hey, there's no way in the world we should have practice on Holy Thursday and Good Friday. I went up and told the principal that there's no way you're taken away from the tritium, the Easter tritium. And a few years ago, our archbishop, our Bishop Francis, I mean, because he handles that, Calvin, he said, there's no more football practices, baseball, whatever on Sundays. Because believe me, those coaches would sneak in practices on Sunday. It's bad enough when our kids play after the schools are out, they play in the civic leagues the city leagues, and all the games are on the weekends. But I make it a point. I really try to make it a point that I, no, if, the, if the baseball games are at, my, my family plays a lot of baseball. We're not a hockey, we're not a hockey family. We're a baseball and, and football family. So um, we make it a point that we try to find an early mass. Sometimes it's at the monastery at 7.15. If it's a 9 o'clock, we have to be at 9 o'clock for a 10 o'clock game. But we try to fit it in as best we can. If somehow circumstances have it, I mean, we just couldn't fit in, they better be home listening to the Mass at home, you know, on TV, on YouTube. But it has to be done. But I don't allow that the other part of it, the latter part, to listen, unless it's dire straits. So, you know, if we make it a point, and as I was saying, the love of the Holy Spirit, Mass does not become an obligation. I remember telling Elias a few, a few weeks ago, you missed Mass on Friday. You got caught up on some things. You know, this is just daily Mass. And I told man, I felt empty that day. Remember when we, huh? Yeah. And we really feel empty when we, you know, and this is new to me. It was prior before I owned a store. I couldn't go to daily mass. I had to get up and drive my hour drive commute to work. But now that I'm free and I've gotten back into, uh, it's like riding a bike, I've gotten back into going to daily mass. If you miss it, you really feel empty, don't you? Is that right? Absolutely. Speak about that, Ferris, a little bit. Because you're, you're, you're my uh, idol there. I see you so happy at mass. Oh, yeah. It's like, uh, you know, imagine eating every day and then not being able to eat. You would be miserable the whole day. Yeah. It's, it's exactly the same the whole day literally thinking about what i missed yeah. what i didn't get and, I, uh, yeah, you're right and uh like the covid the covid was really a blessing to be honest with you because we we yearned for what we missed oh, right? yeah absolutely yeah you know we sometimes we get too accustomed and uh you know sometimes we're too blessed and we're too you know yeah. Um, that, we, that it's too easy, you know. Like here, you could, like in some countries, people will walk twenty miles. We don't know how good we have it because some yeah. some places and yeah. far away. Even uh, we went on uh, vacation on Easter, but I made it sure that my family attended the Good Friday service or the you know, the Easter Sunday service at the at the church. And you know, Mexico has a lot of churches, so even if you're at Cabo, St. Lucas, or if you're at the Cancun, there there's a. So we went to a, a mass. And, uh, and I told everybody, by the way, I said, Matt, and the buses will pick us up for the mass in English is at 10 o'clock. The buses will pick us up from the hotel and take us to the church at 830. So we're going to be there a little early. We'll probably be at the end of the, the uh, Mexican mass, the Spanish mass. And I said, you know, there's no greater day than Easter. So I preached it off from my lungs, from uh, in, uh, in my, you know, top of my lungs. To all my group. And of course, half showed up and half didn't. They were sleeping in because they partied too much. I miss Easter Mass. But even if you're on vacation, we can make our, you know, uh, obligation um, fulfilled. And even when I, I, and I'm a big you know, a football fan. And even when I used to tailgate, and then, you know, and what a waste of time that was, because it takes your whole Sunday away. 
I made sure I made early mass, whether it was at the moment before I tailgated. You know, and I asked people at the tailgate, why couldn't you go to mass? I even asked my why couldn't you go to mass? There's early masses before we start these grilling and all this stuff, you know, and get beat up by, by halftime. Your game is over, the happiness is over. You're thinking about going to the casino to uh, you know, um, swallow up your uh, you know, your misery. <laughs> right. I know Elias is smiling. Why can't we go to mass? Why cannot the obligation, you know, because like you guys said, there's a lack of love of the Holy Spirit. We try to cage the Holy Spirit. Yes. I don't know if this is on track, but one of the things as I get older that I meditate on quite a bit is when you think about the three hours that Jesus was on the cross. The passion. Yeah. Emulates the three years of his ministry and maybe his whole life. When you think about what he did during that three hours, one, he suffered for us. Two, he gave us his mother. He told John, you know, this is your mother. He gave us his mother. Then he forgave the thief on the right. Then he drank the fourth cup and then he died. So when you think about, I mean, there's probably more things that I'm not thinking about, but that three hours was not just agonizing on the cross. He was agonizing, but he was also fulfilling while he was doing that. He undid all the, you're right. He undid everything that Adam and Eve did. He undid everything. He made it all in three anew. hours. Yeah. Yeah. He forgave us too. Forgave oh, yeah, us. Of course, he yeah. forgave the people. But we'll talk that, about the passion when we get into it. Yeah. yeah. Forgave the people that. You guys want a quick five minute break and then we're going to get into the Samaritan one. Any questions on Nicodemus? Master Nicodemus. The hierarchy in the Pharisees. Any questions on him? AJ, just a quick comment. Um, yeah. Usually when, when I watch a Protestant uh, like ministers, yeah. Um, and I think it's related to watch, this chapter. I don't watch him too often. I mean, I, I mean, I see him here and there. Yeah, they have, you know, sometimes they have good sermons. I, I have yeah. to admit. Okay. So a well, lot I'm of the times. Them, you know, I'm not a Joel Olstein fan, but go on. But I'm a lot of times. No, go on. They'll say this. They'll say this prayer. You know, Lord Jesus, I invite you into my life. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. And I repent of my sins. And after that, they say. Uh, friends, if you said this short prayer, we believe that you have been born again, right? Yeah. Now look at the contradiction here, right? Look at the contradiction. It's Jesus says you have to be, you have to be born of water and spirit in order for you to be born again. You know what? But I don't think, I don't know how they use that line when when it's really in contradiction with the Bible. You know what? When you when you they think that's the chrism and that starts it. Um, I remember. Uh, a Protestant uh, teacher at Brother Rice uh, had a child, and I said, are you guys baptizing him soon? He said, no, when they get of age, they can make their choice, but we're going to have a little bit, uh, you know, I don't know, christening service or somebody it wasn't a baptism. I said, what are you talking about? Why won't you baptize? You know, uh, I didn't want to argue with him, but I said that, you know, I just walked away. I said, you know, scripture says you need to be baptized. You know, I wasn't going to give in either. You know what I mean? Um, you're right about this. That is contradiction. Because making a confession, you know, is not being baptized. It's not being sprinkled with water. It's not being immersed with water. You're not bathing with the blood of Christ and coming out anew. You're not getting your new robe. You're not getting the greatest gift that we talked about that I sent you guys that St. Gregory of Nazianza said. And it's free, by the way. God paid the price. He pulled out the wallet with his own blood on that cross. It's a free gift. And it's one of the greatest gift because it allows us to enter into his body, the church. You're 100% right. You cannot make a statement and think you're saved. You can be on the road, but salvation comes by baptism. This is the Lord's way. That's why he says in Matthew Go to all nations at the end. The last 
sentences of Matthew's gospel and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And make disciples of all nations. Did Jesus say, Mike, you're 100% right. I almost missed that because I had it on my notes. Where does it say, go over there and tell them to make a statement that I'm born again? Yeah, nowhere. You're 100,000 percent right. God bless. You. We're gonna take a quick break and then we're gonna come with the Samaritan woman. All right. A quick break. About a few minutes. That's some good Bible study. We don't ask where the Father Bible study. Because you have not found Jesus. I will tell you. It's from 10 30 to 12. I'm sorry. Did you come do that? I don't know. I thought it was like on Saturday. No, he teaches the catechism. Oh, okay. Um, He embarrasses us sometimes. He goes, Yeah, we have a theologian. Yes. (laughs) I just like you. You really like you. But uh, EJ. Mass, I, I've just been so eager lately. I wake up and to go, like, and then I'm just like out of it. We're right? gonna get back to Fridays. That was a nice time. Yeah. I want to do that. Uh-huh. So, is it that guy? If I call him, he'll come. And, wh- when's he gonna do yours? I think my wife has money. Okay, so I think it's the right time. Yeah. yeah. I'm gonna have a so, so, my man, how are you going? So, how are you, Jay? Good. Really good. Yeah. Did you call him? Did you get a hold of him? I never got the number. I thought I was going to get from you today. Cool. I don't have any other number. My wife does. Okay. I'll give you. Okay. I only have my niece in front of me. All right. So, how are you doing? Okay. Right. No, I appreciate it. And thanks, EJ. Yeah, no, there's nothing. I thought when you had your talk, and I wanted you guys to exchange numbers. He said, uh, I was on his way out. That's yeah. Right. I left right after that, thanks. No, I appreciate it. Sure. Good thing I caught him that. Yeah, no, he seemed like a nice guy, so right. I think he understands what it's kind of a good Catholic boy. Is he? Yeah, God bless him. God bless him. Both of you guys come over here, the, the Samaritan woman. I love that story. I love that song. Do you remember Jesus met the woman at the well? Uh, there were, my brother Tommy used to sing it when I was a little kid. And you, know, you read from four. All the way to, uh, you read all the way to just before 23, okay, to 24, all of 23. What is that? You read chapter 4, all the way to 22, right there to the end, okay? Okay. Rami, you better read from 23 all the way to, uh, yeah, to 30, before you get to 39 to end, okay? Yeah, chapter 4. Yeah. Okay. You can read right from this book, too. Okay. Okay. Did you ever hear that song? Jesus met the woman at the well. I don't know, but maybe we'll, we'll talk about it after class. Yeah. But I love it. Getting back into it. Sorry about mentioning the other woman. What? Sorry about mentioning the other woman. Go ahead. Thank you. And you see how he was he was hitting me with an hour he could have had deeper and that and that's all we know. You don't have that. See that? And then we stop taking good how we change this when we sat down. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 
But Father and Son was really good. Yeah, that was good. Yeah, we're doing the same to you. We're doing the same to you. That's pretty good. That intermittent fasting is working out for him, huh? I really do believe that he. Yeah, Okay, we're going to do the Samaritan women. If you're following along, read chapter four. I'm going to invite Peter up and then Ronnie to read the whole chapter, at least the, the whole pericope on the Samaritan woman. What And what a beautiful discourse between God and man here. Jesus and the woman of Samaria. Now, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples. He left Judea and departed again to Galilee. He had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And so Jesus, wearied as he was with his journey, sat down beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For this, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a, for a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well? and drank from it himself and his sons and his cattle. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. The water that I shall give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands and he whom you now have is not your husband. This you said truly. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain. And you say that in Jerusalem is the place to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is 
when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit, and the truth for such the Father seeks to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will show us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then, his disciples came. They marveled that he was talking with a woman. But none said, what do you wish? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into the city and said to the people, come, see a man who told me that all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the city and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples begged them, saying, Rabbi, eat. But when he said to them, I have food to eat of, which you do not know. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him food? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say, there are yet four months, then comes the harvest. I tell you, lift up your eyes and see how the fields are already white for harvest. He who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life. Jesus shifts over here. He's no longer talking to a master Pharisee. He's talking to a adulterous woman. Not the adulterous woman that we, we see later on in John's book. But a woman who has many relationships. Jesus is a groundbreaker. He breaks the norm. Because if you guys know anything about the culture of Jesus' time, the Jewish lifestyle, no rabbi, no man would be seen alone talking to a woman. Just didn't happen. It was taboo. Not for Jesus. This was his daughter. I loved... Uh, couple months, maybe it was four or five months ago that uh, Father John came and gave a homily and he talked about the, the, the woman at the well, the mass, that was the reading of the mass. Remember that? And he said he was married to her and he's right because he's the bridegroom and he's married to each and every one of us. More intimate relationship than we can ever imagine. Not sexually. Far greater love, and John and and John's gospel uses with some. There's no greater love than a friend who lays down his life for another. But I love this discourse, and I think the chosen, uh, you know, I will talk about you know, captured this perfect because Jesus could have went another route to Galilee, to Capernaum. But he chose directly to go through another taboo. Jews never wanted to go into Samaria. First of all, they would probably got lynched. There was a bitterness. You talk about prejudice and racism. There was such a hatred between Jews and Samaritans in the time of Jesus. First of all, let's go back. They are the northern kingdom. And when the Assyrians came, they assimilated with the Assyrians. That's where they get to Samaria. And they intermarried. So the southern kingdom thought they betrayed them. One of the worst betrayals. Not only did they worship you know, the Assyrians who were pagans, they intermarried with them. But the truth of the matter, they had a lot of the... you know the Jewish customs and the law. They just didn't worship in Jerusalem. Samaritans, for the most part, were non-Jews. 
and they were ministered by northern priests from Bethel, not the temple in Jerusalem. And they were hated. They were considered illegitimate children. Bastards. Want to look at it? You can see King 17, 24 to 28, where that hatred starts. Now, Jesus knows he's God. He knows when he's going to come to this well. Hello? The daughter of his needs him. Go on. I got a question. Uh, Mike said the volume not working on his. I don't know. Mine is fine. I don't know. Uh, uh, if you Mike, can hear me. Just... Luke, can you hear me? I could hear you, but Mike, he said I cannot hear you. He cannot hear you. Then maybe it's his issue. Okay. How about Luke? I see you, Luke. You're on. Can you hear me? But you can hear me, so some people can hear me. We'll, we'll... Yeah, Sorry, we EJ. EJ, yeah. it's, it's not Mike that's saying he can't hear you. It's Luke who is it's saying Luke. it. So I'm going to send him a quick message, to letting him know that all of us can hear him except him. So I'll let him know to fix this. We can watch the video. Yeah. Okay. Jesus knew that his daughter needed him. He picked the great ample time to meet his daughter, truly his daughter, truly a child of God, even though she was a Samaritan. And he purposely went to Samaria. And by the way, he sowed seeds that Samaritan, Samaritan would really become Christianized pretty easy. When John and Peter went there, we know in the book of Acts, they were welcomed. Jesus comes to Jacob's well. And I tell you, Jacob's well gave a lot of nourishment and a lot of water and fed the cattle for the patriarch of Israel. For our, you know, for our, our patriarchal great father, Jacob. But Jacob's well, and I tell you this, was dug up by Jacob for this very purpose. Not for the, all the people who drank from it and all the, you know, the patriarchs and their children and the 12 tribes. It was be, dug up because Jesus was gonna be there and he was gonna meet the Samaritan woman from the beginning of time. He had an appointment. There's no time with God. He had an appointment and he had to keep it. Chaldeans, we need to learn to keep our appointments, get to mass a little earlier. Nothing makes me shake my head till 10 minutes and people are still coming. No reason for that. You don't take your kids 10 minutes late to school. That's a cowardly thing. And it really irritates me. Well, Jesus was not late on his appointment. He came, and, if you, and it was a pretty hot day in Israel and Palestine, and it was hot. And this woman comes around 12 noon. Usually, people did their chores. They would come out real early in the morning and get enough water to sustain them for their day. What is to wash clothes, to, to uh, have water for cooking, to drink to wash their face and their feet. You know, they'd bring a lot, a lot of jugs with them. But this woman did not want to be seen by other people. See, she would come in the heat of the day, noon, one o'clock. And Jesus was sitting there probably, I could see him lounging around, smile, beautiful smile. Samaritan woman, no name, woman. And, you know, Jesus uses woman for his mom. So, you know, he held her up pretty high. He said, woman, give me a drink. It's the heat of the day. And she probably looks at him and said, this Jew who thinks he's better than me. And a man, he had alone talking to me. You know, I'm not, you know, I, why is he even talking to me? In biblical times, it's called the sixth hour, associated with really the heat of the day. And nobody, it's a siesta time, does chores during that time, unless you're hiding from something. 
she didn't want to be seen by other women because they would look frown on her and look, look, uh, give her ugly looks. Probably the looks you give somebody that we know she's been around the block a few times because we think we're better. And it's perfect that Jesus sends his apostles away to go buy some material, some food, you know, to, for their journey onwards. So it's just one-on-one. -on -one. And he approaches this woman and he says, I'm pretty thirsty, I need a drink. Because he wants to have a large, long conversation, not going to be a simple conversation with her. And the woman starts to talk to Jesus very earthly. She's on an earthly place. She's going to be talking to the word incarnate. She's going to be talking to the son of the living God. She is in for a beautiful lesson. She says, you know, why are you, a Jew, asking me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? Jesus approaches her and continues to tell her, engages in her that you have to go to a higher plane. Jesus is offering her something greater than earthly wisdom. He's telling her that she's a, first of all, he's telling her that it's okay to be a Samaritan. There's no foreigners to God. Remember that there's no foreigners to God. As I, before we broke, I said, when Jesus died on that Christ, cross, he redeemed all the world. He redeemed everybody. He made a perfect redemption. For Chaldeans, for Italians, for Jews, for Africans, you name it, he died for all of us. No room for prejudice. It's sad that some people are not going to choose that redemption and reject it. It might be the sin of the Holy Spirit rejecting his mercy. Jesus approaches her and says, I want a drink, I'm thirsty. She says, I'm going to give you a drink. She says, you don't even have a pail. You don't even have a, a bucket. You know, where, where are you going to drink from? Then Jesus offers her a gift. The gift of love. The gift, again, of living water. Gift of baptism. Because later on, she's going to be baptized. He's going to, he tells her, you know, but if you only knew you, if you would ask me for a drink, Christine, Jesus says, I will give you a stream of living water. Again, this beautiful dialogue, she doesn't understand it. She goes, well, hurry up and give me this stream of, and then I don't have to come here no more to eat her today. Lekem chachasla. He doesn't point a finger at her. We don't know what a loving God we have. He doesn't say, woman, you're wrong. You've done a lot of bad things, you know. You need to straighten up yourself. He says, if you ask me for water, I would give you a living stream. And she's still on her earthly plane and says, hurry up and give me this. I don't want to come here no more. I don't want to come in the heat of day. I don't want to sweat. He's giving her, if you ask him, the Holy Spirit. The gift of baptism. Gift of water and spirit. He was talking to her about the Holy Spirit. He's, he's talking to her prelude of baptism. The woman refers to Jesus as curios. At first... The woman is referring to him as sir, not Lord here. She doesn't know he's the Messiah. She goes, sir, if you, you know, you, you, how can you, a Jew, ask a Samaritan for something? We don't talk to each other. We're supposed to be hate, hating each other here. Excuse me. And yet you're a man and you're talking to a woman. This is taboo. 
But I just wish you could imagine. That's another person we need to talk to right away when we get to heaven. How was that conversation at the well? How nice was Jesus? Yeah, she didn't even care about water. She went on a hot day carrying this all the way there and left. At first, she refers to him as sir. Later, she's going to refer to him as Lord. Jesus tells the women, if you only knew in which, in whom you're talking to, if you only knew what I can do for you. Jesus is already making claim that he's greater than Jacob. She says, you know, this well was given to us to Jacob. The one here is greater than Jacob. I told Jesus to dig this well. Really, he's telling her just for you. Because I wanted to meet you here. There's no time with God. Believe me, that well was dug up for the Samaritan woman. Jesus tells the woman, if you only knew who you're talking to. Someone greater than Jacob is here. And he's asking you for a drink. Jesus, she tells Jesus that she knows that the Tahib. The Tahib, the prophet, like Moses, is to come and explain everything and solve all the liturgical problems. Because remember, they're worshiping at Bethlehem, I mean at Bethel. The Jews are worshiping at in Jerusalem. And Jesus tells her that he is the Messiah. He is the prophet, and there's not going to be another prophet to them. He says the salvation of the Jews, and he says that. He says a beautiful thing, and this is where Gentile does not just mean non-Jew. Not in God's eyes. And when Jesus is talking about the Jews, there's not a derogatory, because when John sometimes talks about the Jews later on, especially during the Passion, you're going to see there's a little bit derogatory because these are the, the upper uh, Sadducees and upper Pharisees who, be, who wanted to kill him. No, he's, he's talking about Jews as the people, the Jewish people. Not a derogatory term when Jesus says Jews. But he's saying, yes, you people, you Gentiles, you Samaritans, don't know the fullness of God, the fullness of the law, the Mosaic law, the fulfillment of the covenant. Salvation does come from the Jews. He's telling her that. It does come from Abraham, the fulfillment of the covenants that we talked about so much with Dr. Scott Hahn. And that moment is now. She said, well, we know we worship here and you guys worship there. And he says, woman, the time is coming when you will worship in spirit because God is spirit. God is spirit. You don't have to worship here. You can worship pretty soon in the midst of your heart. That doesn't mean we don't go to mass and we don't go to church. It's saying we don't have to go offer a sacrifice at a temple. No more sacrificing animals for sin. Jesus is going to do that for us. Jesus is clearly always talking to women and setting her on a higher plane. Not much different than he's talking to Nicodemus. He tells Nicodemus, you know, you, 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 you knew the law. But you've missed it. But now he's talking very one-on-one, -on -one, very intimate to a daughter who really doesn't know the law. And he says, salvation does come from the Jew. And this is where the term Gentile means. It does not mean non-Jew. It means you don't know God and you don't know God's ways yet. But it's okay. Because I'm here for you too. And then he goes on to this beautiful discourse. Let me go tell my husband. 
He says, no, you don't have a husband. You've been married five times and the one living with, you're living with right now is not even your husband. Because you're my daughter and I know, and it's okay. I'm not going to take you out and stone you. Because the law for adultery was stoning. I'm not going to stone you. I'm going to redeem you. I'm going to redeem you. I'm going to love you. I'm going to take your sins to the cross. I want you to get above this human, human knowledge. There's something greater than Jacob here. The Messiah is here and he's speaking to you. The savior of the world is here and he's going to save you and he loves you. And he doesn't care about your sins. He wants you to sin no more. And I know I'm not, I'm a Jewish rabbi and I'm not supposed to be talking to a woman. But I forget all that because you need healing. You need redemption. You need my love. You need the good news. There's going to be a time when you're not going to have to worship at a temple. God is spirit and you're going to worship spirit in your heart. I'm here to be, I'm here as the new temple. The only temple. And I'm going to reign in your heart. Like Elias says, the Samaritan woman leaves everything behind and runs. Come, everybody, meet the Messiah. He knew everything about me. He told me I had five husbands and the one I'm living with right now is not even my husband. I tell you, she too became one of Jesus' first apostles. And then this beautiful discourse with, you know, the apostles come back and, oh, whoa, is that Jesus? Is he talking to, he's talking to a woman? How could this be? This is scandalous. He's talking to a Samaritan woman. What's going on here? Got to go approach him. Got to tell him, you can't do that. This is not good. If people find out about it, this is going to tarnish you. <laughs> Jesus just sucks on the side. We brought food. You need to eat. No, I got food. I eat different kind of food. My food is redemption for this daughter of mine. I got food that you don't even know about. Can you imagine the love that Jesus had for his daughter who was a fallen daughter of Abraham? She was a fallen daughter of Abraham. There's no difference between her and Zacchaeus. There's no difference. I wish. He told her that I came to this well to redeem you, to save you, and I'm going to die on that cross for you. Just like he told Zacchaeus, today, today, I'm going to come and eat with you. And Zacchaeus cries and says, you know, I'll give everything, you know, that I've stolen four times back. And I'll get half of my wealth. And Jesus turns into the Pharisees and says, you know, today, a son of Abraham has been redeemed. But they couldn't understand that. The heart of the Lord is mercy. The heart of the Lord is love. I came to this well because I had Jacob dig it up because I was going to meet the Samaritan woman at this well at this time. Not too many times Jesus says, I am the Messiah. Not too many times. But this time he told her, I am he. I am the Messiah. I am Lord. And the apostles had to understand, had to understand that Jesus is going to break the barrier of all that tradition of women. He's going to raise up women to the same level of men, not one greater than the other, not one trying to be the other. 
complementary, like John Paul II says. And he's going to forgive her. Just like he's going to forget the adulterous woman. Just like he forgave Mary Magdalene. Just like he forgives Zacchaeus. Just like he called Matthew. Because he's a real God. He's a real Lord. He's a real Messiah that he told Nicodemus. Whoever believes in me will have eternal life. But we can't just walk the walk. We have to receive him in the Holy Eucharist. We've received him in baptism. We have to befriend him. It's okay to ask questions to Jesus in our prayer, like the Samaritan woman. He'll open up to you in prayer. He'll wash away some of the mysteries so you can better understand them. But it has to be through prayer. It has to be through dialogue. We cannot go to Mass as an obligation. We have to go there as love. We have to leave mass like the Samaritan left the well, like, like my brother Elias says. She forgot everything. She was so joyous. She was so happy that she wanted to go tell everybody, hey, listen, yeah, I met the Messiah at Jacob's well. That's the joy. That's why the Holy Spirit wanted this story to be told because it gives a beautiful light not darkness light this lady who was in darkness who was scared to come during the morning to get the water who was full of darkness now i said that one of the key things is light and dark she became a light she didn't care no more she went to hey everybody listen i have found the messiah and he's forgiven me and he told me everything about my past, and I can care less. Let's come meet him. Imagine if we had the joy she has when we leave Mass. Imagine that. The Samaritan woman confesses that she met the Savior of the world. And she says she now understands that salvation does come from the Jews. And it is a fulfillment of the covenants. And it's for the whole world. There's no Jew and Gentile like St. Paul says. I will be a Jew to the Jews and I'll be a Gentile to the Greeks. And I will be rich to the rich and I'll be poor for the poor. And I'll be educated to the educated. And I will be uneducated just to win them all over for Christ. I love this story. I love this story because it, it draws a wonderful picture of how wonderful Jesus is. How much he loves it. The depth of his love. No wonder St. Paul says, I was given a knowledge of his love that no brain can understand, no ears, no nothing can understand what waits us. And some of us want to give it up for a few thrills in this life by the devil's cunning and give it all up. We want to give it all up. We're never going to be able to talk to, if we give it all up, we're not going to be able to talk to the Samaritan woman in heaven. We're not going to be able to talk to St. Paul. We're not going to be able to talk to Nicodemus. All the wonderful things we, we, can, we have waiting for us in heaven. And believe me, believe me, when you receive the Eucharist and you're going to, well, I cannot wait to teach on the Eucharist. We communicate, we receive the Samaritan woman and Nicodemus and St. Paul every time we receive the Eucharist because they're in Christ and whoever's in Christ, we receive him when we receive the Eucharist. Any questions about the Samaritan woman? I think some gets lost on a lot of people in the end of that story. So in verse 39, Mm -hmm. It says, many Samaritans from that city believe in him because of the woman's testimony. You just said she was full of darkness. You just said she goes at noon. Mm -hmm. She doesn't want to be seen. She doesn't want to be looked at. In mm -hmm. Yeah. Not no more, right? And, and she goes into Samaria as a beacon of light. Like, why would people believe her? She's, she's uh, untouchable if she was in India, right? She's somebody that 
nobody want to associate with, but she come. She, she it's come on the earth. She come on the earth, but they believed her. But scum on the earth. Yeah. But scum on the earth. Believed them. But the scum of the earth, Jesus waited eternity to come in and, and save and redeem her. But it says we, people, can you can you understand the depth of God? You're right. Can you understand? Can you understand the depth of God's love? Because the scum of the earth is why Jesus stopped at the Samaritan well, at the well in Samaria, Jacob's well. Can you can we imagine how much love Christ has for us? And he's waiting every single time to have that same approach that he approached the Samaritan woman in the confessional. Amen. Every time we go to the confessional, Jesus is there to forgive us and to smile at us. And he says this and looks up to the father and says, you know what, Lord? You, you know, father, I came to redeem him. I came to redeem her. And look, they came to the confessional. I don't care about their sins. Do you think he cared about her sins? Like Elias, my brother, Elias, she went out with so much joy. Believe me, when John and Peter went to Samaria, they made some inroads because of this. Samaria was quickly Christianized. Any questions out there in the in the over there on YouTube, any coming on the internet? Any questions? Steve, do you have a question? Nope, just taking it all in, my friend. Wonderful, huh? Don't we have the most wonderful Lord? Don't Absolutely. we have the most wonderful God? Amen. I tell you, we if we if you read John's gospel and you read in, in the letters to John, and you cannot not say Jesus is. Is, it, is the Messiah. He's the living God because he loves us so much. Amen. Want to come in and close up with prayer. Um, Mike wanted to say something too. We're going to get together and it's going to be before uh, the end of October. We want to get together just like we got together in the summer. Uh, get together and pray the rosary and have some fellowship. Um, we're going to set this up, right, Mike? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to um, maybe find a day where the weather is going to be decent. I think the temperature is dropping the next couple of days. Hopefully, mm -hmm. I'll come back to the 60s again. Um, and Park is not going to be done until November, so we'll go to Grotto at St. Mary's. And what are, you know, I love that place. I'm going to enter my prayers. On the west side, tomorrow, like 530, outside the abortion clinic, by the Andrews, the North Way. Yeah. There's a lot of people there two days ago. I'll go, I'll go yesterday. Yeah. Over yesterday. Well, I want to do this at, at the grotto with us together. So Mike will set it up. And nothing greater um, than EJ, honoring our, our mother. Yes. You hear me? Yeah. I just want to add one comment on that. That Samaritan woman gradu graduated in the knowledge of the Jesus Christ. Yeah, the beginning, she told him. She told him, you are a Jew guy. Then she told him, are you greater than our father, Jacob? And then she told him, uh, I see you are a prophet. And then she um, told him, are you the Messiah? So she, she started with him from the uh, Jew man and then ended up is like knowing that he is the Messiah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we talked about it. There's someone greater than Jacob here, you know. There's someone yeah, greater just, than Moses here, you know. You're right. I tell you it's something even greater that you won't see in the comedy. I tell you that that well was not dug up for Jacob, our, our you know, our father. It was dug up for the Samaritan woman. Her, her point is she yeah. gradually graduated. Yeah, exactly. It was a, she went from sir to yeah, yeah. That's what I said. Yeah. At first, she says, sir, right. you're right. They die, you're right. Jesus was always invited her to, to go up higher, not just to stay on an earthly plane. You don't need this water. You what really sustains you is baptism, the Holy Spirit. He said, if you ask me, I'll give you, you know, a spring of ever flowing water. And she go, and the earthly, she said, Yes, please give it to me so I don't have to come back here. 
But like Elias said, after she, she received the good news and the well started to spring in her, she forgot the water. She can care less about human needs. She only yeah. wanted earthly needs. You want yeah. And I'm sorry, when is the rosary? We haven't set a date, but we will set one. And I want you there, okay? Would you please let me know because you don't yeah, We'll send set it up anything. and we also have, uh, you know, Elias will post it on. You're not on there, right? No, I don't the, receive you're anything. The, you're not on the exchange, right? You told me you're not? No, no. Okay. Um, I'm going to have you before you don't hang up on everybody. I'm going to have you give your information to Peter, all right? After prayer, okay? Okay. Okay. Ronnie, you want to come and pray? God bless you all. Thank you. Is going to be on Zoom, Rosary, or only you guys? I'm just wondering. Wait, um, uh, wait. wait. We're going to be in person, but we might zoom it. We can zoom it too. Okay, that wouldn't be hard to do, all right? Okay. We can zoom it, all right? Good idea. Thank you. Okay. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Thank you, Father, for this beautiful class that we've had for you to not only allow us to hear the good news, but to allow us to have the opportunity to truly live it out, to live out our baptism in order for us to strengthen our faith, hope, and love. And as St. Paul has said, the greatest of these is love. And for us to truly feel the Lord's love and mercy in each of our lives, each and every day. And for us to show his love through doing wonderful acts of love. And with that, we say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and in the hour of our death. Amen. Before we hang up, I just got one thing to say. And I always, you know, in dialogue with the Holy Spirit, my Lord, uh, to, you know, to work through me to get to people. Um, while I was at Mass today, the reading was Philippians 2, though I, you know, we all know the reading by St. Paul. Though I was in the form of God, did not count, count equality with God. I got a nudge from the Holy Spirit. And he says, this, when John's gospel, he clearly pointed out to me, this is the fulfillment of the, of the prologue. That the word. Although, you know, because this is the word that although he was in the form, didn't count equality. This is the incarnation story. Uh, reread, you know, if you can, reread uh, uh, Philippians 2 and, and try to correlate that with, you know, the prologue from last week. They really do um, connect. They really do. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to be doing a good shepherd. So, really, hey, what's your number? 248. Yep. 722. Okay. 8002. And you don't have Telegram? Telegram. I think I do have it. Is I'll, try it on Telegram? I'll try to find you on it. Yeah, our group chat's on Telegram. Okay. All right. Thank you. So, you don't have the part where it says where Jesus did not.